Welcome to Women in the Nude, where we bear it all, except for our bodies. We'll leave that to your imagination. I'm so glad that I get to do this episode. You guys have been asking for it. It is a Q&A, and you sent me so many wonderful questions, so many that I think I might have to actually make this into two episodes, which I'm totally happy with. Um, so many thoughtful questions, and I, I hope I can answer them in a way that um, that is helpful and uh, that interests you. So let's get started. I love Alexa with lots of lots of A's. You asked me what the hardest thing about being a woman is. That is a tough question. I think it's a question that is very personal in the way that everyone deals with something differently. Um, every woman is put into a different situation, but I guess what I feel like the hardest part about being a woman is, is I guess maybe the standards that we're held to, um, whether it's, you know, looking a certain way, acting a certain way, uh, what paths we're supposed to follow in life. I feel like this upcoming generation, this Gen Z generation is getting so much better at letting people be who they need to be and who they want to be and follow those passions. But I feel like there's a lot of leftover chaos from previous generations. And I know that in my industry, one of the hardest parts about being a woman is what we're supposed to look like. I feel like as much as the business has grown and society has kind of gotten maybe a little bit more open-minded, I think there's still a lot of wolves and sheep's clothing where they say that that's what they want but in reality um they're still holding women to this perfect image of what they're supposed to look like and what they're supposed to sound like and anyone who has a different opinion on that kind of gets slapped on the wrist a little bit like mm, no you're not fitting into that box um and i don't know if that maybe is a little bit more personal for me because of the health issues that i face in a very public way for those of you who don't know, I had PCOS. And so when I was on Priola Liars, um, when I was trying to figure out what was happening with my body, I, I gained a, a lot of weight. I, you know, I, I looked different and that was all shown on camera. So it was, um, it was there for everybody to see. And because I didn't know what was happening, I didn't have an answer for anyone. And it was a very frustrating process. And I think I ended up feeling really empty and it, and it's a bummer. You know, I felt almost responsible for, I felt like I wasn't doing the character justice based on what people expected my character to look like. And I feel like I fell into a bit of a depression in that process. Um, but I think that's just like an easy example of, of something that, you know, women go through that I don't know is i don't know that men necessarily go through it to that degree they do in different ways everybody has i feel like body image um standards for themselves and what they feel like people think that they should look like so kind of going around in circles here but i do think this is a beautiful question and i think that um it's it's something that everyone should kind of evaluate in themselves not only if you are a woman, what you feel like you're holding on to, that's, you know, perception of what people think that you, that you need to look like or be like, um, and ask yourself why and, and see if you were doing anything in those areas that maybe isn't authentic to you. Um, and the way that we look at other people, uh, women are very guilty of the way that we judge other women, um, for decisions, what they look like, what they wear. Um, and so I think, I think that has to change where, you know, why do I feel that way about somebody else? Why do I look at somebody's photo and I, you know, I have all these judgmental thoughts? Like what, what part of me is kind of, I don't, I don't know, slanted or suffering or, or projecting onto somebody else based on uh, what they're doing in their life? I think those are healthy questions. I hope that kind of answered your question. Um, this kind of goes on a different question from Kanashi Kumo. I hope I said that right. And that one is advice on how to gain confidence. And um, it's, I think it's, it's a couple of things. It's a kind of, it's a hard one because I think a lot of it comes from finding yourself 
and that is not an easy task. Part of that is just life experience. Um, and, and I think the easiest way to gain confidence is to try new things, which is really scary. Um, getting to know yourself can be scary. Uh, going through change is scary, but it really is how you develop, how you understand yourself, how you develop your identity in a real way, not just what people think of you. I think confidence is so important in life. Um, it's so apparent and it's life-changing when you gain that. Now it's taken me a very long time to get to the point where I feel very confident in myself and in my body and in my life and in my choices. Uh, and it's not like I don't have bad days, but I do feel like it has gotten easier, but it's a consistent decision. I have to make that decision to be, you know, like, no, I own this, I've that, that I have the confidence to move forward with my life in ways that make sense for me and, and kind of, you know, blocking out that outside perspective or, or opinion, or definitely the ones that are not, um, asked for, which is very hard to do, but I do feel like the more experiences, the, the more new things that I try, the, the more I let myself establish boundaries and understand what is important for my mental health and what I need to do for self-care, the less I care about other people's opinion and the more confidence I gain. Hope that made sense. This also flows into another question. And Laura underscore Canov, I think that's how we can pronounce it. Um, their question was, how do I feel when people try and compliment me when they say that I've lost weight? This is a great question because I think so many people, meanwhile, when they say it, you know, they're Maybe they haven't seen you in a while or, you know, in my circumstances, I've had health issues. So the, oh my gosh, look how tiny you are. Look how incredible you look. Look at how much, oh wow, you're so skinny. Look at all the weight you've lost. It, I think for the most part is meant in a very, you know, nice way. It's meant as a compliment. And in the flip side of that, it can also be offensive in lots of ways because it's kind of acknowledging the fact that your friends or acquaintances or you know, even strangers online, they're acknowledging the fact that you, that they've been judging essentially or monitoring what you've looked like and comparing you to, you know, other, maybe other times in your life or, or before something has happened to you. So it, it is an interesting thing. Um, I don't love it, but I also know that it depends on who it is. It depends on who's telling me that there are people that can say that to me and I'm, I'm not offended by it at all. And I think it's, it's nice gesture. And then there's other people that say it to me where I'm like, really rather you not have, have said that to my face. Um, I think this is a good example of what you weigh versus if you are healthy. Everybody's everybody's healthy is different. It looks different, it feels different, and it's your job to find that for yourself. It's not anybody else's place to um, decide what that is for you. And it's such a complicated, sticky, part of, I feel like society and, and, you know, social media and the way that people look at bodies. Um, but yeah, I have, I have a hard time with that because of how much I've, I've, you know, fluctuated. So my PCOS is dormant currently, but in the past I've fluctuated a lot. So I would gain a lot of weight and then I would lose some of it. And someone would be like, oh my gosh, look how amazing you look. Yeah. But then like in two months later, I fluctuate again. And, it, and then everyone goes kind of quiet about it. And so it's, it's one of those things where like, instead of people maybe complimenting you on getting your health in order, like, oh, you look so healthy 
or how is your health going or how have you been managing it? It's purely based on, on the way that you look. So however you want to take that, I guess my, my feeling on that, you know, compliment is it depends on the person, depends on how they say it. If they are genuine in it, um, if it is kind of led by that, the, the health point of view versus the, their standard of beauty, if that makes sense, but that's a hard one. Um, I guess we can kind of lean into, um, actually, no, what I do want to mention is, um, I'm not going to put their username out here because I'm not going to point fingers, but there was, um, a man that commented on my, ask me questions, but asked me what my height and my weight was. Now this leads into that question where it's, you know, why, why is that question something that anyone needs to know? Um, I'm fine giving up my height. I'm five, five. No one needs to know how much I weigh. Um, all that matters is that I'm feeling really good in the weight that I'm in and it's a healthy weight for me. Um, I've worked really hard to get to the place where I'm at now. Um, and you know, for thousands of reasons, I am in the place that I'm at right now. I hope I stay there or actually I hope I get even better. Um, but that's not, that's not really the point. The fact that somebody even feels the need that, that like, kind of like the audacity, like you're a total stranger and you want to know what I weigh. Why? You know, um, I just kind of like to mention that that was a question that I got. PCOS management. Now, multiple people ask me this and it's also very difficult because PCOS looks different and acts different with every woman. Um, I have really high testosterone when it comes to my PCOS and I've got really low vitamin D. I'm iron deficient. Um, when my PCOS is acting out, it's generally because, um, my hormones are out of whack, obviously. Um, uh, but that's when I gain weight. That's when you see it. Um, but I'm lucky I don't have cysts on my ovaries. So many women deal with so many crazy symptoms on PCOS. Um, and so what works for me in particular is my diet and my endocrinologist, which I highly recommend if you have PCOS or think you might have it, go to an endocrinologist, not just, or instead of your gynecologist, they specialize in hormone issues and they will be able to direct you in the right, um, direction areas to improve and treat your PCOS. Um, cause that's what they specialize in. But my endocrinologist decided that the keto diet was worth a try to see if that would help me. And the keto diet is not for everyone. Um, if it does not suit your body and the way that your body processes things, um, it could be detrimental, but if it is a good thing for your body, it works wonders. Um, and it particularly helps people's hormone issues. Um, and it really increases, uh, brain function. And that's if you do it right. There's a thing called dirty keto, which is kind of the cheating route, which is like eating really high cholesterol foods. So like eating bacon all the time, like in heavy doses or eating really processed foods. Um, those are no nos on the keto diet every now and then bacon's good, but not an essential. Um, it's been a work in progress and I've been able to see such a crazy transformation in my body and so much of it has been diet. So like I eat, you know, high fats, but they're healthy fats. They come from salmon and olive oil and coconut and, um, nuts and really good whole foods and, um, and proteins. And I, I make sure that where I'm sourcing that from is, um, healthy. But then on top of it, I get my blood tested every six months. And this is an important thing because it ensures that you don't have too much fat in your blood, that your PCOS levels are hopefully regulating. Um, and, and that's, 
that's a blessing in, in my life. I've finally gotten to a place where where that has happened and my PCOS is dormant. A huge part of that was having my son. So it can happen to a very small percentage of women where after pregnancy, um, your hormones go back to normal and it, and it's almost like he helped regulate my hormones, um, which was life-changing and a huge blessing. Um, and so that kind of reset my body and then that mixed with a continued strict keto um, has kind of changed my life. Uh, so PCOS is dormant currently. That doesn't mean that it can't change in the future, but I'm in a really good place. Um, I also really encourage those with PCOS to really look into their workout routine because your body behaves differently on keto. So if you are on keto, cardio, high cardio that maybe you're used to trying might not always be the best route. Your body responds really well to strength training um, and things like Pilates and yoga. And, and it's just the way that your body is burning fat over carbs and uh, that you end up getting the best results from that. Um, but I am not a doctor. These are just the things that have helped me. And like I said, PCOS looks different on everybody. Um, a lot of people have gastro issues. And, you know, like I said, those cysts on their ovaries, some people have really high estrogen and not high testosterone. And so your body behaves different with those. Um, this is the first time in my life that I've had a regular period, which is incredible. I was told by 17 different gynecologists that I was lying, um, that it would change with age. Um, that, you know, I'm kind of imagining the things that are happening to me or that I must be eating like a pig because of my weight gain. And it was such a belittling process. And I just, I want to share as much of my PCOS journey as I can to hopefully prevent other women from dealing with that. PCOS can lead to breast cancer. It can lead to ovarian cancer and a plethora of other um, difficulties and illnesses um, in women, which just is awful that a lot of that can be prevented with treatment. Um, I'm also on metformin, which helps me ovulate, which helps keep me regular. It's um, It's got a lot of uses. And again, it's not for everyone, but that really works for me. Um, and, and, you know, it's a constant learning process your body changes with age. So I'm sure that there's things that I'm going to have to do to um, adjust and cater to my body's needs as uh, I get older, um, you know, different stresses and, and travel can also affect my hormones. And it's kind of just always keeping things in, in check as best as possible. Um, yeah, but it, it's, I, I'm thankful that more and more people are finding out about PCOS, that we're creating a bigger community. Um, hopefully that leads to more studies and it being taken more seriously and um, that, you know, women aren't blindsided by these things. Um, I've sp spoken to so many women that have had all of these symptoms, have been checked out by multiple doctors, or they just get given medications and things aren't explained. They don't know why they're taking them. They don't know how much PCOS affects their life um, or they're just on birth controls and they don't even know that they have it because, you know, the, your birth control is masking all sorts of other things. Um, it's just, it's a wild ride being a woman and dealing with women's health. We are always navigating issues that I feel like are just not looked into enough. It's like so many women deal with so many different symptoms that are identical, but there's no real rhyme or reason to the type of treatment we're getting. Um, and I guess I just really wish doctors as a whole, but the doctors would take, would, would just listen a little bit better. Because I feel like so much of it is people not listening to you. And it's it's so frustrating not being heard, especially when it comes to your health. Um, and, and I just, I hope we get to a place where more doctors listen and, and that we just, we get more blood tests because so much of our health 
um, good or bad shows up in our blood. And it feels like it's such an easy thing to do. Um, and so often it just gets overlooked. So many things don't get caught because of that. Um, PCOS also really affects fertility. Now, I think the reason I had an okay time getting pregnant was because I don't have cysts in my ovaries, but particularly with women who do have cysts in their ovaries or have a lot of inflammation down there, it makes it really hard to get pregnant. Uh, when my husband and I decided that we wanted to try and have kids, um, we were expecting not only to probably need help, but that I would probably take over a year. So uh, we were just trying to mentally prepare for that uh, and whatever else would come from that. Um, we thankfully didn't have trouble getting pregnant, but it's always a possibility. A lot of women find out they've got PCOS because they're trying to get pregnant. Now there's a lot of things that doctors can do to help you get pregnant on PCOS, but it does create a lot of complications. Um, gestational diabetes can happen while, or you're, you're more prone to it while you're pregnant if you've got PCOS. Um, lots of different things. So I just, for those who have PCOS or think that they do, I just encourage you to try and get as much information as possible from your doctors, um, from qualified professionals online, um, reading about it, doing whatever you can to arm yourself and really, really, really pay attention to your body and the way that you're feeling. Um, I know when I'm starting to feel out of whack now, I've kind of honed that in. I'm like, mm, something doesn't feel right. And am I doing anything different? Or, you know, um, maybe it's time to go get that blood test and, and see if something's up. Um, I just have to really pay attention to that. And I, I just encourage women to always do that. I don't personally do this. I probably should, but I, I think a really good habit is journaling. And if you date it, especially if it's like in a phone or your app, you can go back and look and see, hmm, I felt kind of weird then and it's happening again and kind of tracking that, seeing if it's around your menstrual cycle. Um, a lot of a lot of what happens is, is, you know, depending on where you are in your cycle. Like I gain five to 10 pounds in water weight right before my period. Um, and it just kind of is what it is. A lot of women deal with that, but it's, it's frustrating. Maybe we go back to that first question. What's the hardest thing about being a woman? Uh, and maybe it's just women's health in general. Um, it's misunderstood in so many ways. So, uh, hopefully talking about it more and building this community, like I was saying, is the way forward. It gets people to pay more attention to what we're going through and we kind of find hope and treatment together. Uh, and the more experiences that are shared, the more informed we become. And, um, I think a lot of the time too, it's, it's you kind of have to like explain that to your doctor. These are all the things that I'm feeling. This does not seem normal. I don't feel normal. Please give me a blood test. That's my advice there. Um, someone asked me, let's see, a couple people asked me, but Brenda X Adamy, I don't know how to say that, sorry. Um, they asked baby number two, question mark. Um, this is a fun one. We are one and done, which to all the moms and the parents out there who get shit for only having one kid, let me tell you, don't listen to them. I'm an only child. I loved being an only child. Um, it's not why we're only having one. I always imagined having more than one kid. Um, I think, I think it is also very personal. So I get a lot of shit for only having one kid, everything from like people that are close to me to strangers where it's, it's like, oh, I'm being selfish or he's going to suffer for not having a sibling or, um, a lot of people are like really intense. So they'll, they'll be like, well, you know, when, when you pass, he'll have no one. Um, we'll get back to that. Um, but a lot of people just think it's cruel to only have one kid, which I think is madness. Uh, everybody's situation is different. Um, a lot of women can't get pregnant again, or, or maybe just in general, it doesn't suit their life. 
Now, Hendrix is a very outgoing, happy kid. He is such a sweet little dude. He is so easy. I mean, you would think that that would make us maybe want to have another, but it doesn't. We feel so complete, just the three of us. Um, it really suits uh, where the, the way we want to raise him, how we want to uh, get him to experience life, um, you know, potential things with my health. It's such a small factor, but it's still something that I have to take into consideration. I was lucky with my pregnancy that I didn't have too many things go wrong because of my PCOS, but your body behaves differently with every pregnancy. I could have a really adverse effect um, and and really suffer with my health uh, if I were to have another baby. And then that question mark um, ends up, you know, say, say I did have a really hard bad pregnancy and something went really wrong. Um, I can't be the mom that I want to be to Hendrix or a new baby in that case. So there's so many factors involved. Um, I love kids. I love babies. I, I love raising him. He's the best thing ever. He's like the biggest joy in my life. Um, but I know wholeheartedly that, that he's it. And I, um, and those unsolicited opinions about how bad that is is just crazy to me, um, and it and it it slides right off my back because I'm confident in my decision, um, and both my husband and I are completely on the same page about it. So really, it's a it's a personal thing. It's about you and your family and and your story and, and your direction in life. It has nothing to do with anybody else. And if you want to have a hundred kids, <laughs> maybe not a hundred, you want to have more than one kid you know that is good on you and 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 kids are awesome um but yes short answer is one and done and we're loving it um and let's see i'm reading your wonderful questions i'm gonna pick hardest part about being an actress i love my job i have been in the industry for almost 24 years, which is insane. It goes by really fast. I started when I was around three and a half, four, and I, I started in commercials and, and, um, modeling and then got into TV when I was around five. And I've just always loved it. My parents were really great. They let me know that whenever, or if ever I wanted to stop, I could. And I just, I never got to that point. I, I love being on set. I love the way it, watching it, how it all works. I love understanding every different department. Um, we're kind of like carnies. We're like a bunch of misfits that get together and have, you know, we spend more time together than we do with our family. So it's it's this like crazy experience where it's, it's temporary. You see these people so often um, and they take up, yeah, they're, they're such a big part of your lives. And then you hardly see them once the, the show or the movie's over. It's such a such a weird thing, but it's also addicting in so many ways. Um, as an actress, you get to put on all of these like different personas. And um, I feel like every time I do something new, I fall in love with my craft all over again. Um, but with all the joys that I feel from acting, uh, it's not easy. Um, there's lots of different ways that it's hard. You know, now that I'm a mom, I'm and a wife, I'm spending a lot of time away from my family when I'm working and that that's really hard. Um, mom guilt is a huge thing. And for instance, this movie that I just shot, um, I, I hardly saw them and I felt so guilty in so many ways. And he's, you know, Hendrix is changing like every second. He's two and a half and he's doing so many new things and he's talking more and um, understanding more and and he's very opinionated and, and I feel like I miss out on all those little things. Um, but, you know, it's such a, it's such a double-edged sword. Like I, I love what I'm doing and even sometimes that gives me guilt. I'm like, oh, I feel guilty for loving what I'm doing so much when, you know, I'm not with him. But I think it's it's such a blessing to be able to do what I love um, and take care of my family while doing it. 
And I think it's so good for kids to see their parents um, passionate about what they do and and working hard. And and I hope that he he feels that the older he gets. Um, But I think more so one of the harder things is everything that comes with being an actress. Um, There's a lot of benefits, but it's it's a hard thing mentally. You you kind of almost have to treat yourself like the business. Um, and there's a lot of expectations. There's a lot of added stress. Um, you know, things that you feel like you have to share based on social media in order to succeed. A lot of the ways that we are hired now are different than when I first started in the industry. And the majority of it is based on what we look like and how many followers we have. From a business mindset, because I want to produce, I want to direct, I want to do all those things, I understand it. Um, But that doesn't make it any easier when you're in that position. And I kind of see it as a challenge in a lot of ways. So I've, I've kind of like rewired myself to look at it differently. And I think that's a healthy perspective. Um... It's uh, it's awesome that I get to do a podcast like Women in the Nude where I'm choosing the conversation. I'm, you know, doing my best to to help women and create a community where we can be honest. Um, and that is really fulfilling to me. So I feel like I've kind of taken the power back where it's it's like, sure, um, I will share a lot of aspects of myself, but it's still how I want to be presented and how I want to um, share my story versus maybe having it kind of chosen or written for me. Now that will still happen, but at least my voice is out there in the way that I want it to be heard. Um, So yeah, a lot of the things are an uphill battle, but I would never change it. I love what I do. And I I hope somehow um, I affect people in in a positive way. Um, and it's so amazing to be able to connect with people all over the world and know that we're all sharing a lot of the same experiences, no matter our situations and the different countries that we live in. And um, it's it's refreshing. It can also be very difficult, but it is refreshing. And so I think I'm just always constantly trying to find the positives because I kind of am a pessimist in, in many ways working through it, you know, um, but, but it is a blessing in disguise. So even though there's lots of hard things in it, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, has my life changed, um, from being a mom, Lynn, she asked me this question. Um, absolutely. My life naturally forever changed when I had Hendrix, but I have never felt stronger I've never felt more empowered um, since being a mom. It's it's so crazy to see a little you outside your body running around that looks like your partner and sounds like your partner and you meshed. It's like, it's such a wonderful, crazy experience to see this little human grow. Um, and he's such an amazing kid. But it's also awesome to see both growth in myself and my husband. I feel like, you know, you're your priorities shift, but in a way of, but at least for, in our experience, in a positive way, it's like given us more drive for the future and, and, um, and being more confident and comfortable in ourselves and, and what, what we want, what we want for him and what we want out of life. Um, so it has completely changed my life for the better. And, um, I'm, so proud to be his mom. I really like this question. Biggest thing you've learned this year. And if you have any advice, um, that is from, I think Ellie goes to, I think that's maybe how that's said. Um, 2023 has been a, a great year. Actually, a lot of growth has happened this year. Um, I feel like I've really taken ownership of who I am. I feel like um, I've learned to be more proactive and 
I've I've definitely felt more empowered. Um, but it's made a big difference uh, putting that effort into mental health and self care, and and blocking out other voices. Uh, I'm really lucky to have a partner like my husband, who is constantly supporting me and kind of pushing me to grow in in all the right ways. Um, and I just have like a drive to be healthier and better. And and I really started being okay with setting boundaries, which I think is super healthy. Highly recommend. Um, and I think just constantly evaluating the relationships in my life, um, myself, and and not in like a not in a crazy way where I'm I'm not content, but it really just is like how can I be better? How can this situation be better? Are certain things in my life serving me in a positive light? And I think this connotation towards like a negative connotation towards being selfish is kind of wrong in a lot of ways. Um, So I really started to navigate that and I've realized that it's okay to be selfish in, in, in the fact that like working on yourself is not a bad thing. Choosing yourself is not a bad thing. Um, you know, like compassion and kindness and, and taking care of the people you love. Those are all great things. Um, but you will not be the best person. You won't affect people in, um, in a good way, or at least not to the fullest if you haven't worked on yourself. So, um, I guess, yeah, learning to be more selfish in lots of ways. Um, when did you decide to get into mental health? That's from Ambreen. And that's a great question. I, a lot of it actually started in 2023. Um, I've, I feel like I've known a lot of the, the lessons that I've, or I've, I've heard a lot of mental health lessons. I've, I've known the gist of it. Um, but I really started to, to understand how important it is and put it into practice. I'd say in the last year, year and a half. Um, a lot of it has been a journey stemming from PCOS and becoming a mom. And obviously COVID affected a lot of that. Um, but I've, I think I've just realized that not only is it so important for me, but that community, like I was saying, is so it's it's essential to to not only know that you've got other people, regardless if you know them in person or not, that are dealing with the same issues. You're you're not alone. Um, I think that's just so so important, and and I'm just so glad that I'm able to share that. It's why I created Women in the Nude. It's um, it's why I love working on mental health uh, and hoping that just a little bit of this is helping somebody else out there, even if it's just one person. Um, so yeah, I think I, I put mental health at, at kind of like the top of the list and it, and it trickles down and, you know, it affects everything in your life and, and it's, it's vital. So yeah, I just encourage everybody to, to take a look at their mental health and, and figure out what they can do to consistently make it better. Uh, let's see. What does being healed mean to me? That is from someone, I think it's Amis XA. I love that question. Um, he, being healed. I don't think, you know, you're constantly going through different experiences. So, so being healed, I feel like that's kind of, and I don't mean this in a pessimistic way, but it's kind of unachievable. I think being healed to me is is handling situations. Like being healed means, okay, I'm going through a difficult time or I went through a difficult time and how do I navigate this and get through this so that I can be better on the other side? Um, so being healed to me is, I guess, being self-aware and understanding that, you know, um, the only person that is responsible for my own healing is me. And that's a hard lesson because I feel like, you know, a lot of people are to blame in your own personal trauma. 
So it's not, it's generally not your fault, but it is up to you to work through it and make sure that, that you get out of it essentially. Um, and that you grow from it instead of just kind of sinking in it. And it's one of the hardest things to deal with. And it's, and there's no rule book for it. There's no, you know, the, there's no right answer for everybody. Everybody deals with, um, hurt differently no matter what level that is at and i think you just got to find what works for you but being healed to me is um knowing that no matter how long or how hard it is i can get through it um i think this will be our last question maybe this will be a little bit lighter my go-to skincare I use a lot of coconut oil and a lot of witch hazel, which are very um, cost effective. Um, but I love Laneige and I love Bare Essentials and I love Dior um, and Hourglass. Those are my go-to um, like makeup and skincare. Um, I like to be as natural as possible. Um, and... Yeah, my advice with skincare is is to make it a habit, which is kind of comical coming from me because um, I'm a hypocrite in that way. I feel like I go, sometimes I go weeks without doing my skincare routine, and I definitely notice the difference. I'm putting other things first. So um, my go-to skincare products are what I mentioned below. I'll tag some of my favorite products in the bio, and you let me know what you think of them. And um, thank you guys so much for listening to my podcast, Women in the Nude. I hope that you feel like you're part of our community. And um, I hope that my answers um, properly answered your questions. And please DM me and comment below if you have any other questions and if you liked this episode and want to hear more episodes like this. I adore you all. I'm so thankful for you. And, um, you know, we don't grow without our community and, and we just want to get better. So please let us know what you think. Let us know what you would like to see and what you'd like to hear. Um, and if there are any guests that you're dying to have on Women in the Nude. Love you all. And that's a wrap on another empowering episode of Women in the Nude. The conversation doesn't stop here. Stay connected with us by following us on Instagram, Women in the New Podcast, for behind-the-scenes sneak peeks, thought-provoking quotes, and updates on upcoming episodes. Subscribe to us on YouTube for full-length video podcasts, Sasha Petersa, as well as visiting our website, Women in the New Podcast, for more resources and past episodes. Thank you for joining us on this naked journey to wellness and self-love. Remember, vulnerability is strength, and by sharing our stories, we empower each other. Special thanks to my amazing producer, Hudson Schaefer, a.k.a. my hot husband, for making this podcast possible.